As a result of his arguments, Plato concludes that the object of knowledge must be eternal, unchanging, and perfect. And this leads him to accept the forms. So Plato takes the realm of particular things, which in philosophical speak uh, are known as tokens, individuals, uh, is in constant flux. They fall under categories, which would be types. And for Plato, a universal, sometimes referred to as a form, like a platonic form, and sometimes called ideas. Although the use of ideas is rather misleading because for Plato, the forms aren't in your mind, they're really real. The fact that they're the realest things of all. So these universals are eternal, unchanging, and perfect, at least according to Plato. And particulars participate in the forms or imitate them or some other form of interaction. And this is a rather mysterious sort of thing. And we'll see in the future why this is kind of a problem for Plato's theory. But he claims that individuals, tokens, particulars, participate in the forms. And this makes each thing what it is, makes it fall under a category. So if you raise the philosophical question, in virtue of what are all cats cats, the answer for Plato would be catness, not not from the Hunger Games, but the form of catness. So given that these forms are so unusual, they're eternal, unchanging, and perfect, one might wonder where they are. And the answer seems to be that they're in what is called, sometimes sarcastically, the Platonic heaven. Now, it's not a heaven like the heaven of Christianity, so it's not that God is there and there are angels and stuff, but it's a place that is, well, not here. It's not in space-time. So the question then is, how do we know about such entities if they don't exist here? Well, the answer is this, roughly. So given that these forms are unchanging, eternal, and perfect, and most importantly, exist in a Platonic hyperspace, how is it that we know about them? Well, according to Plato, and spoiler alert here, you learn about them when you're dead. And he lays this out in his dialogue, the Mino. And he calls this the doctrine of recollection. The character of Mino in the dialogue, the Mino, presents a paradox to Socrates. If you do not know what you are seeking, then you will not know if you have found it. If you do know what you are seeking, there is no need to seek since you already know. To use kind of an analogy, suppose you were you know, on a great quest to find an item. I will call this the Virex Nilo. And you, but you have no idea what it is. You just, you know, suppose you're playing um, you know, a role-playing game or you know, video game, and it says to go get this Virex Nilo. But you have no idea what it is. For all you know, you might already have it uh, because you don't know what it is. Now, of course, if you already have it, there's no need to go looking for it since you've already got it. So to solve this paradox, Plato does this. He claims that you acquire this knowledge before your soul is embodied, that when you're you know, dead before or before you, you live, uh, however that would work. And so when the soul is not in the body, it communes, hangs out with the forms, and then when it becomes embodied again, perhaps, or for the first time, it brings this knowledge with it. And so how does he get around the paradox? Well, the idea is this. You forget what you learned. And because, you know, when you think about it, you're probably an obvious counter to Plato would be, hmm, I don't seem to remember hanging out, you know, with these perfect forms and Platonic hyperspace. I don't seem to recall encountering, you know, the form of justice, the form of, you know, cat, the form of, you know, burrito. I don't have any recollection of that. And so his, his answer to this is, ah, when you're reborn, you forget that you know. But it's still there. To use um, like an old style analogy, it'd be like having a filing cabinet in which all the labels are missing. All the stuff is still in there, but you when you look at the folders it's just folders of stuff you'd have you'd have to go dig around to use a more modern analogy imagine you've got a um, a drive on your you know 
laptop or you could take your smartphone anything with memory and it's erased now when you erase stuff on your computer smartphone etc it's not really gone it's still there what your computer is doing essentially is saying to itself this space can be written over it's kind of like going back to the filing cabinet analogy it's like being in an office and someone says to you hey that filing cabinet you know it's full of stuff but i don't want any of it but um you know don't really want to put the work into emptying it so just throw stuff out when you need to store stuff and hard drives are kind of the same way once you like throw something in the trash it's not really gone until it's overwritten so you can think of it this way your soul is hanging out with the forms it gets loaded up with all this this information you know about perfect justice and perfect burrito and perfect everything and then you're reborn and poo, your hard drive is erased but it's all still there you just can't find it so how does it get bit get brought back to your attention well this is where the doctrine of recollection comes in according to socrates through the use of the dialectic the socratic method you can be led to recall what you had forgotten to use a computer analogy if you erase stuff off your computer and it's in like the trash you can go you know and you know recover from the trash or even if you empty the trash with the right utility someone can restore the the file and as you might imagine there are people who go around getting intentionally getting old hard drives and trying to restore them so they can steal stuff from people so as a unrelated philosophic tip whenever you have a computer or phone or whatever uh, be sure to completely reformat it and if you're really paranoid you'd want to overwrite the hard drive the same way the department of defense does you can get these free utilities that are just overwrite everything and so that way everything is wiped out but getting back to plato the idea is again when you're dead you're hanging out with the forms the shock of rebirth makes you forget but it's all still there and when you talk philosophically you start recalling stuff now unfortunately you don't recall sort of really practical you know everyday stuff so you wouldn't have in there say the winning lottery numbers from next week and you wouldn't have um, like the location of say buried treasure you wouldn't have that kind of stuff you just have knowledge of the perfect forms so you learn about them when you're when you're dead now these forms are super weird so what do they got going on well here's how they work this takes us into his metaphysics and his metaphysics and epistemology are you know just kind of smushed together and sort of inseparable so these forms are part of his metaphysics if you ask plato before he's dead you know what is reality made of he would say there were the forms in this platonic you know hyperspace or however you describe it and then there's the imperfect physical world the forms for him are the true objects of knowledge and that's where the epistemology comes in and so they're real objective independent and unchanging and they're non-spatial temporal and this leads of course to a lot of problems the biggest of which is well one of the many big ones because there's lots of big ones is how they interact with this world you know how do the forms get participated in by stuff here so how does the form of burrito cause all the burritos here and critics of plato's view always bring bring that up so why does he have these forms well again one reason is he needs it for his epistemology because he has argued himself into a position where he needs changeless uh, perfect objects of knowledge that are not known by the senses so you get the forms so why also have an imperfect world well he ends up with kind of a compromise and here's how the compromise arises it arises out of the paradox of change to change a thing has to also remain the same if it didn't remain the same at least something some to some degree it would be destroyed rather than changed now philosophers before plato obviously addressed you know this paradox and there are two kind of extremes of this one is our good dead friend heraclitus who is a pre-socratic and we just have a few fragments from him uh, he claimed that the world is fire both literally made of fire 
and metaphorically in that it constantly changes. So for Heraclitus, change is the ultimate reality and permanence an illusion. Now, for Plato, if the world was as Heraclitus described, knowledge would be impossible. Now, another fellow was this guy Parmenides, and his name does sound a bit like a cheese, but it's a philosopher. So if you ever at a restaurant, uh, you know, after, well, I guess restaurants are kind of open now, and the waiter comes up and says, would you like some Parmenides on your spaghetti? Uh, say no, because that he'd be sprinkling ground up philosopher, and that would probably not be a good thing to eat. So Parmenides, the philosopher, not the cheese, regarded change as an illusion. And so the seeming change in the world is not real. It is mere, mere appearance. But obviously enough, change seems to be a fact because if there was no change, it would seem to be impossible to, you know, watch this YouTube video. Now, Plato decides, hey, these guys are kind of right, kind of wrong. So like any great thinker, he decides to steal from you know, other thinkers. So his solution is this. He takes the view that there's a world of constant change. And that is the world that we live in, the imperfect world. So that would be like Heraclitus's world. This world changes constantly. And given Plato's view, you can't know this world because of this constant change. It is a world of fire. The world of the forms is essentially Parmenides' world. There is, no, there is no change there. They're perfect and can be known. So he embraces both Heraclitus and Parmenides. So how do these forms sort of do stuff in the world? Well, we'll turn to that next.